<laughs> Hello there, and welcome once again to It's a Mystery, where we present another mixture of stories jam-packed with mysticism and intrigue. <laughs> so if Granny and all the other grown-ups get a little bit nervous with things that go bump in the night, tell them to leave the room now, because Shelley and Ben have been tracking down more nerve-tingling mysteries for us all to unravel. We reveal why this tree stump in this forest in Sussex is famous all over the world. And what is so mysterious about this postcard? <laughs> you won't believe this one. And what changed these four men's lives forever in the deserts of Egypt? You know, a lot of people ask me, do I get scared by any of the mysteries that Ben and Shelley bring in? Well, sometimes, maybe a bit. But not all of them are scary, are they? Like this one. This one is more of a game, a bit of a challenge for you. Because it's a mystery why a country village that you may never have visited and you may not even know the name of should be so familiar. <laughs> See if you can work out why. I'm in a village in the south of England unlike any other. It may look like any ordinary local village, but there's things about it you might just recognise. In fact, it's so well known that thousands of people come here every year. But where is it? And what is it that's so familiar? This is nearby Ashdown Forest. It's an enormous forest of at least 100 acres, full of every kind of tree and loads of different species of animals and birds. There are lots of little pathways leading to secret clearings and loads of streams with lovely little stepping stones. There's a special kind of atmosphere here. I'm somewhere else in the forest and I've got another clue for you. This old tree stump is completely hollowed out and there's a small opening just at the front. So, who or what might have lived here. This is Gill's Lap, and what an amazing view. You can see the whole forest for miles and miles. It's so peaceful and quiet up here. It's like an enchanted hilltop. And over here, we've got yet another clue to our mystery. The inscription on top of this stone reads, and by and by they came to an enchanted place on the very top of the forest called Galleon's Lap. Ow, what's that doing here? A pot of honey? Ah, another clue. So, why is the village so well known? Well, let's have another look at the clues. The large wood, the hollow tree stump and the inscription on the stone. Could they be connected to some kind of fairy tale, such as Little Red Riding Hood or Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? Do they sound familiar? What do you think? Aha, uh -huh, look at this rabbit hole. That must mean there's a family of rabbits down there. In fact, that's another clue, the identity of this location. I'm back near the village now, on this beautiful little bridge running over a stream. In fact, it's an ideal place to play poo sticks. Come on, let's go and have a game. Now, just to refresh your memory, poo sticks is the game where you all have a stick. Thank you, Becky. There you go, Adam. And what you have to do is drop your sticks one side of the bridge and it's the first stick to arrive the other side that's the winner. Are you ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. Drop them. Oh, congratulations, well done. I reckon you guys are too good for me. I could do some more practice. So, have you guessed yet? Where am I? Well, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> the clues are all there. The hundred-acre wood, the honey, the hollow tree stump, the inscription, the rabbit holes, and the game of poo sticks. <laughs> have you got it yet? Yes. This is the village where Winnie the Pooh lived. The stories of Winnie the Pooh were written in the 1920s by A. A. Milne, who lived in a farm just outside the village of Hartfield. The stories were inspired by his son, Christopher Robin, and his collection of soft toys like this, Edward Bear, otherwise known as Winnie the Pooh. And their adventures were set in the real-life village of Hartfield, which remains much the same today as it did all those years ago. So, the mystery is solved. Winnie the Pooh is the reason why so many people come to visit Hartfield. It is such a beautiful little village. Do you know what? You can walk through the same wood as Christopher Robin, take a look where Pooh Bear lived in a nearby tree stump, 
but mind where you tread, though, because you could easily fall down a little rabbit hole, just like Winnie the Pooh here. And while you're there, take a look at the amazing view from Gill's Lap, or as it's known in the story, Galleon's Lap. And you can even have a game of poo sticks on the same bridge as Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin. In fact, since A.A. Milne wrote the stories, children of all ages have come to Hartfield to read about Pooh's adventures within the magical surroundings of Ashdown Forest. It really does bring the tales to life. So, where does the honey come into it? Well, Winnie the Pooh was particularly partial to the odd spoonful. And come to think of it, so am I. Oh, yeah. Mm. Me too. So there you go. It's nice to know that some of our favourite fictional characters lived in places that really do exist. Mystery solved. Save us some. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jack Greaves, and I live in Haslam, Chesterfield. I had just finished my breakfast when I heard the post come through the door. I went to pick it up and noticed a small old-fashioned postcard. On the front was a black and white picture of Lowestoft. I didn't know anybody who had been on holiday to Lowestoft, so I turned it over to see who had sent it. The postcard was addressed to the Watson family and was sent from someone called Herbert. The message was written in pencil and read, Dear Auntie, just a few lines to let you know we have arrived safely by car and we are having a lovely time with the family. Decent weather, mother well, love to all. It was weird, because the address on the postcard exactly matched our address. Well, we didn't know anyone called Herbert or even a Watson family. So, an old-fashioned postcard arrived at Jack's house, but it was addressed to a family he'd never heard of and he didn't know the person who'd sent it. So could the post office have made a mistake? I put the card to one side for a couple of days while I tried to think of an explanation. When I picked it up again, I checked the postmark and it was August the 7th, 1924. Then I realised the postcard had been lost for 75 years. I couldn't believe the postcard had taken so long to get to its destination. What made it more of a mystery, the card had been given a new postmark in Sheffield. But there was no new stamp on it. It still had the original penny red stamp on from 75 years ago. Well, we talked to Patrick O'Neill of the post office, who suggested that someone had found the old postcard and posted it into the system again. This would explain the new postmark. But the post office only accept letters and cards with the correct type of stamp. So that does not explain how it could have arrived at Jack's address with an old, out-of-date stamp. And what's even stranger is that the penny red would have been out of circulation by the time the postcard was first posted. So why was it used? I was really curious to find out more about the strange postcard. I asked some of the older neighbours on our street to see if they'd ever heard of the Watsons. To my surprise, I was told that a family called the Watsons had lived in our house, but they'd moved out over 60 years ago. So that explains why the postcard was addressed to the Watsons, even though no one of that name lived there. But Jack didn't stop there. He contacted the programme and we made some inquiries and managed to track down a relative of the original Watson family. The postcard has since been returned to its rightful owner, who was just as surprised as Jack to receive the mysterious postcard. <laughs> oh, and as for the out-of-date stamp, the mystery remains. Who knows what'll come through our postbox next? Right then, I have got a really bizarre one for you now. It's a mystery what untold disaster a sinister box could bring to anyone who came into contact with it. Our strange story begins over a hundred years ago with a group of men travelling abroad. They were there to experience the art and culture of the country they were visiting. I have a magnificent offer to make you. A wonderful antique box has come into my possession and I'm keen to set it. Come with me and you can view it. Come this way, come this way. I will show you. They were all desperate to purchase this enchanting casket and to make things fair, they drew lots. The man who won was overjoyed and he handed over the money and had the beautiful box delivered to his hotel. 
A little later, he was seen leaving the hotel and walking in the direction of the desert. He never returned. The next day, one of the other men was accidentally shot in the arm by a servant. The third, on his return to England, found that all his money had been lost. And the final man, caught a severe illness, lost his job and ended up selling matches on the streets. Oh dear. So what's going on then? Four men all suffered terrible misfortune. Could it be a coincidence? Or is there some other explanation? And what part does the mysterious box play in this tale of misery? Well, this was just the beginning of the story. The casket eventually reached England. The box was put on display in a museum, and it was here that the trouble really started. The night watchman frequently reported hearing hammering and sobbing coming from the casket. What earth is that? One watchman even died while on duty in the room, which prompted all the other watchmen to resign. So, what could possibly be in this terrible box? Well, it was actually thought to be the coffin of the priestess of Amun Ra, who lived three and a half thousand years ago. When she died, she was placed in a richly decorated coffin just like this and buried deep in a vault near Luxor in Egypt. So why is it said that the casket could bring such bad fortune to everyone? Maybe it was cursed. Well, I've been doing a little bit of research into the story and there are many examples of curses being inscribed on the tombs of Egyptian pharaohs. These curses warn intruders not to disturb the mummies and the treasures that lie within. Ah, so what you're saying is it might be possible that by moving the mummy and its coffin, the power of some ancient Egyptian curse came into effect. Yes, you see, within 10 years, the coffin was supposed to have struck down 20 people with misfortune, disaster, or even death. In fact, the museum was so disturbed by its evil influence that they made the decision to sell it. Ah, but the story doesn't end there, does it? No. You see, reports differ, but it was once thought that the box may have been bought eventually by an American archaeologist who dismissed the string of tragedies as simple coincidence. It was believed that he took the coffin home on a certain ship bound for New York. The ship set sail and everything appeared to be running smoothly. Or was it? Because on the night of the 14th of April, 1912, the coffin of the priestess of Amun Ra may well have accompanied 1,500 passengers to its final resting place at the bottom of the icy North Atlantic Ocean. And the name of the ship it was travelling on was the Titanic. So do you reckon that the curse of the mummy could have been responsible? Mystery unsolved. <laughs> So there you go, another fascinating collection of mysterious stories. But don't forget, <laughs> there's many more where they came from, so make sure you come back next week. Now, to keep you going, here's something for you to have a think about. When a fire broke out in an aeroplane, a distressed passenger opened the emergency exit and threw himself out, even though he had no parachute. So how was it that he escaped unharmed? Have a think about it, and if you do work it out, don't tell anyone till next week, <laughs> and I'll see you then. Hey, it's a mystery back.